All right, so for our first day of class, blogging for SEO, we're going to start off with a few examples of different websites that have a blog to guide us to the idea that every website, every business should have a blog. So go ahead and open up your web browser. You can choose any one you'd like. We've got all the popular ones down here. Just go ahead and open any web browser. And in a nutshell, the reason why we are engaging in blogging is to create content for the search engines to find. Oh, I'm going to be writing notes myself also in a little notepad file, and I'll give you these notes at the end of the day in the network folder. So if you'd like to take your own notes, that's fine, and I'll also be writing my own notes. But what I want to say up here is use blogging as a way to improve your search engine rankings. Search engine is the generic term for Google, Bing, Yahoo, AOL search, whatever you use to search. Because nowadays, even though we still get it on our doorstep, hardly many people use the yellow pages. I still get one. I don't want it. I put it in the recycle bin right away. You probably do also. Maybe put it in the fireplace during our cold San Diego winters. But hardly many people use the phone book as, as we used to. More people search. And search is so ubiquitous, it's built into your web browser. Here's search right in Firefox. Search in Chrome. Search in Internet Explorer. It's all built in on your phone. If you ask your phone, what's, the, what's a good taco shop nearby? It's going to search online. It's going to use Google or Bing or Yahoo or whatever it is, and it's going to find a website and show you results. And if we want to get found easier by the search engines, that's the whole art and science and magic of SEO, search engine optimization. How do I get my website optimized to be found by the search engines? We then want to use blogging as one way to improve our rankings, one of many ways. Because it creates content the search engines can index. And that's just a fancy term for store. It's going to find your content and store it. It's going to save it. So when someone searches for taco shops in San Diego and you've got an article, a blog post on your website about that topic, you could get found. When you write content of what people are searching for, you could get found. And this whole class is about that. What should I write? How should I write? Uh, how do I apply it to my website? Do's and don'ts and all of that. But in a nutshell, every website should do blogging because it helps you get found. And I'm often going to say these hedge words about could or possibly or leads to. I'm never gonna say this will work. Uh, I'm never gonna say um, you know, this is foolproof. I can't do that. I can't be concrete because this SEO is it's inexact because of so many factors. You could have a lot of competition. You could be yet another web designer, yet another realtor, yet another fencing company, yet another dog walking company. There's a lot of competition. So even if you do all of these things, you still might not be number one on Google. You might be number two. Close enough. You might be number five. Close enough. But it might be difficult to get to the very top because of a lot of factors. So I can't always say, I can't ever say, make sure you blog and you'll be number one. I can say, make sure you blog and it will help you get to number one. And so if I'm saying that every website or every online presence should blog, you might say, well, I can't think of anything that I could write about for my business. Let me show you some examples here of some websites that my company has worked on that have given us good results in SEO. There's this restaurant in Chula Vista called Aquí es Texcoco. Uh, if you go to that address, this is one of our clients. Um, they are a Mexican food restaurant. They've gotten some good uh, results in that they've been featured in the local television. They've been featured on the Travel Channel, Food Network. Um, they've got a secret catering that I would love to talk about, but I can't going on tomorrow. Um, I'll tell you guys later after it's done, but 
um, they've been doing really well. They started in, in Tijuana in 1990, came to the U.S. here in San Diego, 2008, and they opened another location in Los Angeles last year, and they're eyeing expanding over to Las Vegas. They're doing really well, and a lot of it, of course, is because of the food and the, and the quality and such, but it's also because of the marketing. It's building an awareness of the company. Uh, and that includes, for this client, having social media, having a nice website, being able to order online, being featured on TV, on YouTube, and having a blog, being uh, getting accolades from the press. So basically, this company, via many factors, is successful. And tangibly, what you could do is uh, if you look at this client, this is one of our clients that is the most full-featured. We do the most for them. And if you want to succeed, look at all the things we do for this client, learn from it for free, and you apply it yourself. Obviously, this is a client that hires us and pays us well to do it all. But look at these clients that I'm going to show you, see what works, and apply it to yourself. Like, for example, the social media. It's not just a website. Nowadays, that's minimal. Having a website for your business is the minimum thing to do. A few years ago, that was great, but now it's the minimum thing. Now it's getting to be that the minimum thing, or a better thing to do, is get on social media. Are you also on Twitter? Are you on Instagram or Snapchat or YouTube, um, Google+, Plus, Facebook, etc.? Are you on any of these networks? If you're not, that might be a reason why perhaps you're not getting found on the search engines. That discussion of social media is a deeper one for the social media class, but I will mention here quick tips for good SEO. Use social media. How? That's the other class. Social media. But you want to think about using social media to help your SEO. This class, write blogs. Have a good functional website. This is some quick tips here. Um, develop your keywords. We get into these details in these other classes because there's a lot to learn. That's the social media class. This is this class, the blogging class. Have a good website. That's the WordPress class. <coughs> Develop your keywords. That's the SEO class. So all of these concepts are a full class in and of themselves, a whole month long or longer. And on this one we focus about the blogging. But these are some quick tips how to actually do it. Take the other class. But look at what this client has. It's, got, it's engaged in all of these things and more. And so for this particular client, it's a Mexican food restaurant. But it's not, uh, it's not Tex-Mex, it's not traditional California Mexican food. So you're not going to find, you know, nachos and California burritos. You're going to find traditional Mexican lamb barbecue. That's barbacoa de borrego. So traditional Mexican lamb barbecue. Um, they have a lot of food here that is very unique. Like this in the background here, chicharrón de queso. That's basically crispy cheese cooked to the consistency of like potato chips. This is a great appetizer. You know, we're getting close to lunch. Sorry about that. But uh, this, this is this is cheese. It's grilled cheese. It becomes crispy, and then you get it with guacamole, and it's dip. Uh, you don't see that in almost anywhere else. The f food itself is is lamb, slow roasted lamb, barbecue. Um, flautas, all of that stuff. So the food here is unique and the purpose of the blog on this website is to educate people about the food served here. So if you take a quick look at the blog, there are articles here. And we'll get all in, we'll get it of course into all the nuances about how long should they be, how often should I publish them. We'll talk about all of that stuff. But in general, with this particular client, they serve moronga. 
without reading this article. How many of you know what that is? No one. Read that article, you'll know what it is. Maybe you hear people talking about, I just went to this place, I had moronga. Or like, I miss my grandma's moronga. You're like, what is that? So you search on, on, on YouTube, uh, you search on, on Google or Yahoo, what's moronga? Now, that's one of the secrets here. People are going to search for things. Why not create articles, blog posts, about those things people searching, people are searching for? That goes into the concept of uh, your keywords. So I'll say, here's an idea. Write articles on the search topics people are engaging in. Question. So when you're writing that title for the blog, if you want to put it so that you're, you're pegging what people are searching, does it affect it when you add more detail to it? Like, how to make more of the this is my grandma's recipe or something like that? It does. It does, actually. The more specific you are, the more valuable it could be. So if I write an article simply titled Moronga, that might not be as powerful as an, a title that is, what is Moronga? Or, how to make Moronga? You could write multiple types of articles on a similar topic and use all of those ideas. One article with some of those keywords and one article with other keywords. So basically, write articles on the search topics people engage in. That's one idea there. That's one idea of what to write. You've got, let's say, I always uh, make up this fictional business in most of my companies called Victor's Bakery. And I uh, want people to come to my website, Victor's Bakery. So what would you be interested in the world of baking? What would you be interested in learning? Any ideas? Recipes on cookies, vegan-friendly cupcakes, gluten-free desserts. You may probably have ideas of what you might want to search for regarding baked goods, uh, cookies, etc. Those things that I just threw out, those could be articles for my Victor's Bakery website. Uh, I could write an article, our recipe on gluten-free cupcakes. And when someone searches that, gluten-free cupcake recipes, I have an article that could help me get found. That's the big secret of why you want a blog, creating content for the search engines to find, so that when people search, the search engines can say, here's a website about that, your website. So let's see what else. Here are some keywords here as well. This is another article. You might be, you might think of one day, okay, I'm, I'm gonna have uh, a party, I want some good Mexican food, um, I'm gonna search, best Mexican food catering reaching for the best Mexican food catering. So those keywords there are in that article. Not every single one of your articles has to be that in that in that vein of, of a question and such, but think about it in terms of, of what are people searching for. Um, not every single article, of course, can be exactly like that. Uh, let me show an example over here. Uh, this one right here. This, article, this title here is not 100% focused on these search terms in that, um, in that uh, how many of you know what Zagat is? A few of you. That's a very famous restaurant reviewing um, publication. They've been around 40 years. To get rated by Zagat is a big deal. Not everyone is. So this is more of a self-congratulatory article or post about we got rated by Zagat. People are not really going to search for that, perhaps. But the point of this is that this creates more content for the search engines to find where these keywords might be searched for. Just taking a look at a few others again, some other self-congratulatory self ones. We've had, uh, the client has had various celebrity chefs and such visiting uh, visiting the restaurant throughout the years. And so here's just sort of a self-congratulatory post about who's visited the restaurant, but it still has a little bit of that SEO magic sprinkled in because whenever you write anything, and we'll get to this in detail later, when you write anything, you want to think about how can it spread farther. 
Right now this article exists on our website, but how can it spread farther? And that's via social media. So right here, idea. How to, or spread your, spread your uh, blogs via social media. Get more people to read them or find them via social media. We have the social media class where we go into detail, but we'll touch upon it later once we actually have some articles. But this is, social media is a form of marketing, a form of advertising. So I teach a whole social media class. Again, uh, a new one just started yesterday. You, you're welcome to come next Tuesday, 6 p.m. Uh, to start on day two of that. You'll be able to catch up because remember I record all my lectures. You'll be able to catch up on day one of the social media class. But in that class, I focus on one network per day. We just talked about Twitter extensively yesterday. Next week will be Google+. Plus. Next week will be Facebook. Next week will be Pinterest. Next week will be YouTube. We're going to talk about one social network in depth as much as we can in the time allotted because I could teach a class four days straight on Twitter four days straight on, t on YouTube, five days on Instagram. But in that class, I give us an overview of all of the networks. And the purpose of it is, I wrote something, I'm going to tweet about it. I'm going to get all my 20 followers. I'm going to tell my 20 followers, I wrote a new article. I'm going to tell the 50 people on Facebook that liked my page, I wrote a new article. I'm going to share on Instagram a little preview photo to tell my followers there, I wrote a new article. So I'm using the followers and the likes and the subscribers on social media as a captive audience to tell them, this is new, check this out, read this, buy that. So social media is a form of marketing. And so, for example, one of these articles, if you actually click to, to view in detail, you'll see the article, uh, and then you'll see the ability for people to share it. Notice this has been shared on... Facebook a good amount of times, 76 likes on Facebook, 4 on Google+. Twitter used to have a, a number there, how many times it was tweeted, and they took it away, which is dumb. But at least here we can see that it has been shared of other, to other social media. Let's say I've got 10 followers on Twitter, and I share this article on Twitter. But one of the people that follows me on Twitter has 1,000 followers and she retweeted my tweet, suddenly my article reached 1,010 people, the 10 that I had directly and the 1,000 that they had, friends of friends. So that's why, in a nutshell, you also want to use social media. You could, it could help you get your content shared further than your reach. So I'll have a checklist for you later on about all of these things we should be doing, but I'm just showing you generally, conceptually, here's a Mexican food restaurant. You might not think, why would they have a blog? Look at all of the kinds of articles being written here, and we'll talk about those in detail with ideas and such later. Um, but this is an example of a site, one of our full featured clients where we do everything. We did the photography, we did the website, we do the blogs, we do the social media. It seems to be working. Any questions so far? Yes? There's no, there's no answer because one person could do this, but it'll be a lot of work. Yeah. Or two to six people, and then it could be done easier. On our particular team, I can always just give the advice from what we've done, but in our team we have usually two people working on the social media, one person that focuses on the blog, and maybe two or three that might work on the website. So whatever someone's strengths are, they, they go for it and we organize it into, into the work. But the more people you have to do this, the better, just because it could be a lot of work, especially when you have a lot of clients. Okay, so this is one example. Let's look at another client and another website of another topic. Let's look at elsavalencia.com.
And so Valencia.com is an up-and-coming jeweler. She makes her own 20-karat uh, gold uh, jewelry pieces. Her website is an e-commerce site, so you can buy the pieces. Mother's Day is coming. And so um, when, you, when you go here, you see the pieces. This is a blog as well, because there are stories behind these pieces, these one-of-a-kind pieces. These are not mass-produced. You buy this one, and it's the unique one. And so there are stories behind all of these pieces. So the purpose of this blog is to educate people on the process of the pieces, why they're valuable, why they're, why, why they're beautiful, what's the meaning behind them. Uh, and again, to create content when people search all of these keywords. There are articles here uh, that guide people to the, to the content. So you can get a preview of the articles. There's an article about accessorizing. And so maybe I want to read that. It'll have pictures. It'll have text. You see how good the jewelry looks, the story behind it. And then, of course, there will be links to buy. Once you've seen these pictures, maybe shared on Instagram. Um, you're enticed, and then you you click to go to the to the shop, and then the pieces are there, and then you and then you buy. So this blog, the purpose there is to again educate, build awareness. Um, maybe with these photos. Uh, oh, it's ten karat gold. Sorry, not twenty. Uh, but with these articles that could then help get more uh, more more views, more traffic, more sales. So just about every business uh, we can write some content for because the search engines we'll make a note here the search engines. I'm going to usually say generically search engines. I'm not going to say Google, I'm not going to say Yahoo, Bing, whatever. The search engines, because people use different search engines. The search engines um, want to rank sites higher that have uh, timely, relevant content. Meaning you're going to rank higher on the search engines page if you have timely relevant content. Relevant in that when people search they will find you because you are relevant. So create content for people to find. Timely because you will update on a regular basis. Again on my checklist and other uh, lectures we'll go into detail of what that means. But if you think about your website and your competitor's website. You both created a website a year ago about the same topic. You're across town, you're both uh, realtors, you're both trying to make sales, you both have a website. So how is, how is the search engine going to rank one or, one or you or the other person higher? One way is that you are blogging and that you are timely, meaning that your website is updated more regularly, more constantly than the, comp than the competition. The competition updated their website a year ago, but you updated yours three months ago. The search engine sees that, and that's a factor which might get you a higher ranking. I can't tell you, of course. Make sure you've updated last week, two weeks ago, nine months ago. I can't tell you that. Those things are trade secrets of the search engines. Um, but I can tell you that if you haven't updated your site in a while, that could be hurting you, because no one's finding you the search engines want to show the latest content. And that doesn't mean update your homepage logo or change your banner or change the design. It doesn't mean that kind of change. It means what's content that the search engines can find, like articles that you write in your blog. That's content that the search engines care about that, change, that changes more than changing your logo, 
changing your colors, changing your footer. That doesn't matter to the search engines much. What matters is the content of your blocks. Yes? Okay, so say if you have a website and you have like an open forum type blog with your, um, with your customers that's on there, what's the pros and cons to that? And basically, I'm not the only one that's blogging all the time. Well, just to confirm, is it is that you let other people write articles, or is it that people can uh, can comment on articles that already exist? They're pretty much writing um, about their personal experience, so they're writing their own articles. And um, like I've created a forum so that they're they become kind of like the main person, so they can talk about themselves and what you know. Um, items that they have or whatever it may be. Um, that, is, that is valuable. Uh, any kind of content that is updated on a regular basis is valuable. The downside could be in that you have to manage and moderate that because if you give people the opportunity to write something, someone may uh, write weird off-topic things that might turn away traffic. So if you're letting people write on your site, you should still have some sort of mechanism to approve what they write, or proofread it, you know, to to moderate it, just so that it doesn't devolve into fl flame wars and spam. So kind of like that. let it go through a approval process yeah. before it's actually valid. Yeah, that would be more valuable because then you'll get the best stuff showing up on your site. The search engines will see that and help rank you. If what happens, and this happened to one of our clients a few years ago, we set up a, a, a classic kind of forum uh, and people could create an account and write their own stuff. And what had happened was eventually the spam bots took over and all of the articles, all the posts were spam. We had to shut it down because the client paid us to set it up but didn't pay us to moderate it. It was going to be on their shoulders and they never did it. So then it got overrun with spam and that was hurting their, their rankings. So if you do let other people contribute to your site, just set up a way to, to approve it. Um, so these are some exam a couple of examples of, uh, of websites, commerce websites that are trying to sell something and they've got a blog. Let's say we want to look at things in a different kind of way. Let's say I simply want to write. I like to write. I want to put my thoughts out there. And probably you want people to read that. You don't just want to exist in a vacuum. You want other people to read your stuff and maybe comment and build a community. That's a viable thing to do as well. So let me show you an example, one that is not focused on any sort of e-commerce or, or a big brand. This one is my personal blog for one of my hobbies. If you go to vmcompost.com slash blog, uh, I like to read and collect comic books. I've been doing it for just about 30 years now. And um, I like to write about comics. I like to do videos about comics. And I've got here a, a blog. And I'm not trying to make money. Uh, I'm not trying to sell my own comic. I'm not trying to get hired as a comic artist or whatever. I'm just trying to write some stuff about comics. Um, I can make a little money off of this, however. Anyone know how, possibly? If I'm not selling anything directly, is there any possible way you might think about how I might be making money here? The ads, the advertising. If you put ads on your blog, you could make some money off of that. So I like to write about this stuff. Why not put some icing on the cake? Ads. Hopefully not obtrusive. And that could result in some revenue. So that's a possible reason why to get into blogging. Write what you like, and you could make money off of that. So here's an article about what does the UPC symbol on comics mean? So they've all got a little symbol there. There's actually a code behind that. There's an article about that with a video. Here I'm talking about cool comic book covers, the Mighty Thor, number one. So I write these different things, pictures, video, whatever. Get some traffic because I also share on social media. People come to read the articles, listen to the podcast. Maybe once in a while someone clicks on an ad. I do need a big old dog on my shirt, so I'll buy that. Whatever ad yours, whatever ad yours was, maybe whatever shows up here, I do need. Uh, e I I'm our beacon by Michael McCloskey. I do need that. 
and people buy that, and I could get a little money off of that. So the purpose of this blog is to write about what I like, and on the side, make a little money off of it. So here's a few examples then of some blogs. We'll go into details about keywords, and categories, and length, and frequency. We'll talk about all of those details, of course. I'm just showing a general idea why you would blog, why every site should have a blog. The short answer is it will help, it could help, your SEO. Any questions so far? Okay, so... All of these sites that I've shown have their blog attached directly to the site. So vmcampus.com slash blog, or aquiestexcoco.com slash blog, elsevalencia.com slash blog. They've got the blog attached on the site. That's not the only way to do it. You could write your blogs over on Blogger. You can write them on LinkedIn. Facebook has a new blog feature. You could write your blogs outside of your site. That's perfectly fine. I recommend you write your blogs on your site. You attach the blog system to your site. The reason for that is you'll get more of the traffic. So I'm going to say here, recommendation. Add a blog to your site instead of off of your site. So instead of doing your blogging on LinkedIn, or Facebook, or Blogger, or Blogspot, WordPress.com, etc., I recommend put it on your site. That draws traffic to your site, not their site. Their site is blogger.com, blogspot.com, wordpress.com. That's you're getting traffic to their site, their servers, their online presence. You're helping them writing your stuff on their site. I recommend write these blogs on your own site. And how to do that, we'll talk about that later, but it's really going to depend on what kind of site you have if you've got a site. The short answer of how to do that use a WordPress site uh, software. Use the WordPress software. Use WordPress to create a website. Because all of the sites I've shown you have been WordPress websites. We saw that Akiestex Coco was full featured with a shopping cart and social media and all of this stuff. That was WordPress. Elsa Valencia, that was WordPress. My own site, that was WordPress. WordPress is not just limited to writing blogs. They can create a full, featured, powerful website. Question? No, you don't need to know any, any code or anything to use WordPress. It's got a nice user interface. You click buttons, you drag and drop, and it does it. There are many ways to make a website, but I bring up WordPress because it's the most popular one. I say use WordPress site software because it's very popular. Uh, I see that it's got about 25% market share globally. 25% of all websites in the world, which is billions of websites in the world, hundreds of millions of websites use WordPress. It's a very popular software. It's popular. It's easy to use. And it's got a great price. It's free. There are some things to purchase that we'll talk about later, but the software itself is free. I've been doing web design since 2000, so 16 years, and it was hard in the beginning because you had to know the code. You had to write the code for your website. Then this amazing software came out called Dreamweaver. It's still around. People still teach it. It's still valuable, but that was the next generation. Use software instead of writing code. Then the newest generation is something like WordPress. 
it's even easier. But the thing about Dreamweaver is that it's not free. In the beginning it was like two hundred dollars and then it got even more expensive and now it's part of a collection of software which is like fifty dollars a month. So Word, uh, Dreamweaver is still around, it's still useful, it's not free. WordPress, the software itself, is free. Other things about it are not, which we'll talk about later. And so when my company started, we were using HTML and Dreamweaver, and now we pretty much exclusively use WordPress. We use other software once in a while, but WordPress is the big one because it's so popular, it's ubiquitous, it's free, it's powerful. Uh, a client would ask us in the old days to build a site, and we would make a great site for them. Then they'd ask, could you change this? Could you change that? And we would. Then they'd say, okay, could we change this ourselves? You say, yes, here's your password, all your login info, now I just use Dreamweaver to change your site. You'll say, what's Dreamweaver? So then they can't change their site. So then now, um, with WordPress, we can create a great looking site, very powerful, and then give them access very easily to their site for them to make changes and set it up in a way so that they don't break their own site. A client could break their site if they get into the code or if they do it via Dreamweaver, perhaps. So you can set different permissions in WordPress. And there's newer ones that have come out also. Wix, Weebly, Squarespace, on and on. There's a newer generation. Are they better? To some degree, perhaps. But still, the big, the big kid on the block is, is, is WordPress. So if you've got a website right now and it's in Squarespace, that's fine. Keep it. If you like it, keep it. You'll have the ability to make blogs on your site with Squarespace, with Wix, with Weebly, whatever. But if you don't have a website, or are thinking about making a website, I recommend WordPress. If you've already got a website, and it's in WordPress, great, we can add a blog to it, we can add more features to it. And so we want to add a blog to it, rather than off somewhere, or else we might not drive the traffic back to your site. We're going to talk about WordPress, so let's go. Uh, let's let's go look at uh, WordPress.com. This says create your new website for free. WordPress.com is the best place for your personal blog or business site. So we're going to use this for the class, but if you already have your own site, feel free to use it. I still recommend you create a free account here. We'll do it together in a moment. But I recommend you create a free account here, learn what I'm going to talk about, and then apply it to your real site. You can delete this later. People always ask, what's the difference between WordPress.com and WordPress.org? Let's take a quick look at WordPress.org. Both .com and .org come from the same parent company. The WordPress.com is basically get up and running right away. Create an account, you've got a blog. WordPress.org is basically download the software and install it yourself and then you've got a, a WordPress site. Uh, so we'll say, great, I want WordPress.com. Why would I ever look at WordPress.org? The big downside, well, let's do this, compare and contrast WordPress.com. WordPress.com, WordPress.org. This is free. This is free. Um, what you get out of WordPress.com is they do it for you. On .org, you do it yourself. You have to set up the software yourself with WordPress.org. They do it all for you, basically, at WordPress.com. So they manage it, meaning they take care of updating it, they take care of backing it up, they take care of all that managerial stuff. On .org, you manage it. So it's looking pretty dire for .org. I don't really want it too much, it seems, based on what we've talked about here. But here's the downside. This might be a big downside. On WordPress.com, 
cannot use plugins. On .org can use plugins. Plugins are like mini apps that give you more features. On .com you cannot use plugins. Plugins such as an e-commerce plugin to sell products, a chat feature to talk to your customers live, um, you know, a specialized Twitter plugin to show your tweets in a special way. Plugins, these are extra features that don't come with WordPress. These are little apps that you can get oftentimes for free that add more features to your site. You cannot use them on .com, but you can on .org. You can't use them in .com because WordPress.com company does not want to do tech support for someone else's plugin. These plugins come from someone that created it in their garage, someone that's part of a design studio. You know, other people or companies besides WordPress.com invent these things. And that's why WordPress.com does not want to troubleshoot them, does not want to tech support them and fix them. But on .org, you are free to use as many plugins as you want. You are free to enhance your site as much as you want, or break your site as much as you want with plugins. But you have that freedom to do more. That's a downside there, perhaps. Another downside of .com is um, don't get a unique name. On .org, you do get a unique name. This means that by default, on WordPress.com, you're going to get victorsbakery.wordpress.com. On .org, you're going to get victorsbakery.com. Both are real websites that exist on the internet where anyone can visit and such. But which of these two, perhaps, might you trust more? Not trust, but which of these would you believe more, or which of them would you gravitate more toward? Probably the full .com, that's what you've always seen. I've seen, you know, of course, victorsbakery.com, pmdinteractive.com, vmcinc.net, akistoscopo.com. I've seen these websites that have a real name, .com, .net, .biz, .org, whatever, that they're not attached to someone else's website. So... Bright Smiles Daycare.wordpress.com or Bright Smiles Daycare.com. By default, you're going to get the, the one that's not unique, the one that's branded with WordPress. You can pay to take that away, but it's honestly much more expensive than it needs to be. So those are some big concepts here, pros and cons. If you want the short answer, get .org. The long answer is it's going to depend on various things. And in this class, we're going to use .com. Because it's free, we can get started right away. Let me actually say free asterisk, which means not free. The .org is sort of actually not free because you have to download and install the software on your own website. This is not free. Getting your name on the internet, .com, .net, whatever, that's not free. Um, so you are going to have to pay for your little piece of the internet. Once you've got that, then you can <coughs> add your WordPress software. You have this full control. So for this class, we're going to do the .com because I'm not going to assume that everyone came in today with a website. I'm not going to assume that everyone came in with a WordPress website. And I'm not going to ask everyone, take out your credit cards and let's go buy your own website. So we're going to use the .com, but whatever we do here will apply to the, the .org. And whatever we do here, we can transfer to your own. And I, I use the term of .org and .com very loosey-goosey, but I, I shouldn't because the proper term is a um, hosted solution and a self-hosted solution, meaning that when you're on .org, you're, it's your self-hosted one. You paid for it. 
you set it up, you manage it, you're doing it all yourself. On the .com, it's the hosted one. They host it, they manage it, they secure it, all of that. You have to deal with this yourself. So I should say, are you going self-hosted or are you going hosted? Rather than .org or .com, even though it's easier to say. That's the big difference. I recommend the self-hosted solution. It takes more work and effort, but for this class we will do the hosted solution because we can get up and running faster. I do go into more detail about this later on in the course. If you do want to transfer to a real hosted, a real self-hosted one, we'll talk about it later. We will create an account here in just a moment, but we'll take our first break just to, uh, just to process our things so far. We'll take a break. When we come back, we'll create this account, and then we'll see what we need to do. It's 147. We'll be back at 157 and then we'll go on.